going inside the issues of our community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. American Health Insurance has its roots in the 1930s when an administrator at Baylor Hospital in Dallas, Texas introduced the concept which matured into the not-for-profit Blue Cross Blue Shield systems. Private insurers entered the field during World War II as employers competing for scarce labor mar in a scarce labor market used enhanced benefit packages to woo workers. After the war, the government encouraged the growth of employer-based health insurance systems by granting tax breaks for employer contributions. This sort of employee-based, multiple-payer, private health care system is unique in the industrialized world. Over the years, the government has stepped in to, to relieve pressure points in the system through Medicare for the elderly, Medicaid for the poor, and various programs to try to cover children. Proposals uh, for a sweeping government-based system reach back to 1948, but have consistently been defeated. President Barack Obama has made health care reform a priority, arguing that it is important for long-term economic health and global competitiveness. There are many issues involved, but several basic ones dominate. First, coverage. In 2007, approximately 45.7 million Americans, about 15.3 percent, were uninsured. Of those uh, who were insured, about 67.5 percent have private insurance with employer-based plans covering 59.3 percent of Americans. Today, about 27.8 percent are enrolled in government insurance plans, whether that's Medicare, Medicaid, or military uh, health insurance. These issues, in turn, are being driven by rapidly rising health care costs. In 2007, Americans spent approximately $2.2 trillion on health care, about 16.2 percent of the gross domestic product. That is up from 7.2 percent of the GDP in 1970, and that's about $7,400 for every American. Compared to some global economic trading partners and competitors, we spend significantly more on health care. The U.S. House of Representatives has prepared one version of a health care reform bill. The Senate still does not have a draft to debate, but is working on it. During the current recess, House members are in their districts talking about health care. I am joined this morning by Steve Driehaus, the first term Democratic congressman representing Ohio 1st Congressional District, and by Colleen O'Toole, the president of the Greater Cincinnati Health Council, which facilitates collaboration between area hospitals and health care providers. Steve, welcome back. Colleen, welcome to Japan. Thanks very much. Uh, Steve, this is um, just a proposal in the House, mm -hmm. and there were other ones perking around and may emerge ultimately, and the Senate's now debating a proposal. But where are you? What's your view of this proposal that's out there right now? Well, I, I still don't think it's clear as to what we're going to move forward on. The proposal, as you've described, uh, was introduced and it was taken up by three different committees. Those three different committees then reported out different versions of the same bill with pretty important distinctions. Uh, one of them, when it comes to the, the pay for, has a threshold on the surcharge of $250,000. Uh, the other has it as $500,000. That's a big distinction. Wait a minute, I, I, I missed. Wait, wait, wait. Well, this is when, when we talk about the health care proposal, uh, much of the cost okay. uh, of this is going to be. Uh, taken up by savings and, and we're going to, to really work the system for savings through preventative care, through health care IT, through a whole variety of things. However, in the proposal there is also a surcharge uh, on individuals and businesses uh, that pay individual income tax and, and, don't, and, and small businesses who don't currently offer health care to their employees if their payroll uh, goes beyond two hundred fifty thousand okay. dollars in one case, five hundred thousand in another. But that's it's very contentious. That's what we're talking about. That's what I'm going out and talking to small businesses about. Do you have a clear view yet? Have you have you decided well, what I, you're going to do, or are you or are you really still trying to figure that out? I'm trying to figure that out because I think you frame the issue very well. It, this is about economic competitiveness, but it's also about creating you know and and making sure that we have the best quality healthcare system in the world, but that we can continue to sustain it and that it is affordable. Uh, you know, we need to be around, we need to focus on health care and preventative care. And right now, I feel that we do too much around 
disease management and this fee-for-service reimbursement model. Now, disease management obviously is critical, but it's not enough. We'll get to all of that. Mm -hmm. Colleen, one of the things that I find interesting about the discussion this time is that a lot of people in the healthcare industry, loosely defined, uh, hospitals, uh, doctors, medical groups, seem to be much more attuned to talking about some sort of significant change than say in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. Is that your sense? Is that where we are in Cincinnati as well, the people that you work with? Absolutely, Dan. In this area and across the country, not only are the providers, hospitals and physicians very engaged in this discussion, but I think what gives me a lot of hope is that in addition to the providers, the business community, the insurance companies, all of the stakeholders are at the table and they're willing to talk about what could work. They may have different opinions, but I think what's different now is each of the stakeholder groups has been willing to put something on the table that has been important to them in the current system, but they're willing to compromise on to see that more people have coverage and to see that we have a sustainable system into the future. Give me an example of something that you think is significant that somebody's willing to, to give on. In the um, healthcare industry, we've heard the National Insurance Association say, we're willing to stop excluding people for pre-existing conditions if everybody has coverage if individuals are required to have coverage so that we can be assured that our costs will be spread out over the entire population including those who are healthy as well as those who are sick right now people like our college age kids who just get out of college and start working have the option to say no when insurance is offered to them. Those are the healthy people we want in the insurance model so that they can help subsidize the cost of, of those who are more ill. This, this pre-existing condition thing is very, very important. I, I spent time with a small business yesterday in Western Hills, very concerned about increased government presence in health care. And then they turned around and told me their premiums are going up by 30% next year because one of the partner's children has an autoimmune disease that you know the insurance company obviously they're worried about costs in the future and their premiums are going to go up by 30 percent everywhere I go I hear this and so this this issue of covering pre-existing conditions and also the issue of rescission not cutting people off right. because they're taking advantage that is they're getting sick and the insurance company is paying for it not setting a limit and cutting them off to treat that illness is also very important. You know, it seems to me, based on this really thumbnail sketch I gave about the, the development of our system, we do have an employer-based system. That's mm -hmm. sort of the view of this. Having been self-employed myself for 20 years and knowing what it's like to be out there trying to buy, but also watching companies go through this, there is a sense for me that change will occur when businesses say, we can't do this anymore, either because of the things you described or just because they're constantly negotiating the next contract, then reporting back to their employees, and no matter what they report back, their employees are unhappy. It's, it's a cycle that's it's terrible to be in. Businesses are saying that right now, but when they cut health insurance, their employees don't have an option. I mean, try as an individual to go out there on the private market Didn't and get insurance. So that's what at least the House bill addresses. It, it creates a system whereby private insurers as well as this public option would exist so that you would go into that marketplace and you and they're a tiered system. So you can get the basic health care, you can get you know medium health care, and you can get the advanced health care with all the bells and whistles. Um, but the private sector as well as the government run plan would compete. For, for your business. And we'll come back, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think one of the port important things for people to hear when the discussion is about an individual mandate is to hear that people who can't afford it, who are not already eligible for Medicaid, but who still couldn't afford private insurance in a number of these plans would have subsidies. So it's not as if they would be expected to pay the entire cost of a private plan on their own. In addition, I think one of the things that really strikes fear in the heart of small businesses is that they would have to bear costs when they're not providing insurance to their employees already. 
or that they would have to stop in the future when they believe that it's the right thing to do. At some point, I think the important provisions of a number of these bills about subsidizing small businesses and subsidizing individuals needs to be recognized. That's a very important component of some of these bills. Yeah, we want to make this affordable. So, you know, if we're going to say you absolutely have to go out there and, and get coverage, just like we do if you're going to drive a car, mm -hmm. you know, we've got to make it uh, affordable for you. Because right now people are getting coverage, but it's in the emergency room, and that costs everybody else. You know, Colleen, this affordability question, though, um, there was a study, a popular report in the New Yorker magazine back in June about McAllen, Texas. Mm -hmm. and basically highlighting, throwing a spotlight on our fee for procedure uh, system that we've got. And doctors make money, or hospitals make money, by doing procedures. And in one sense, aren't we trapped? If we, everybody wants to include everybody under health insurance, mm -hmm. but under our pay system, I, I mean, aren't we doomed to just driving the cost here forever? Well, I think that's a really important point in this discussion because one of the things that a lot of us talk about is how uh, badly aligned the incentives are in the current system. And the opportunity for us here is to realign the incentives. So if we allow physicians and hospitals, as an example, to work better together than they are allowed to do in the current system, there are certain regulations that prohibit physicians and hospitals for col to collaborate on improving quality and providing... Give an example. There are some antitrust regulations that prohibit them from doing that and there are also some what are called stark regulations that keep hospitals from providing um, extra payments to physicians to work with them to make care more efficient. Mm -hmm. So those kinds of regulations were set up for good intentions, but they don't allow the, hosp the hospitals and physicians to work together in a more efficient way. So one of the ways to try to get around that is being talked about is bundling payments to a group of providers, hospitals, physicians, nurses, uh, therapists, so that for a particular condition, the payment is for the entire episode of care. Mm. And then it's among the providers to figure out the best quality way to provide that care. We know from businesses that if we reduce the variation in care, we can not only improve quality, but we can reduce cost. It's been shown in other industries. We're not very good at it in healthcare yet, but it's a great opportunity if we change the incentives. Well, and there, there's some great models around the country, the Mayo Clinic being the premier example of, of how this is done. And it's really about providing a medical home for an individual so that you can go and be taken care of in a holistic manner rather than a, a, a doctor being incentivized to prescribe more services that they then profit from or they then get reimbursed for. Now, this isn't happening widely across the system. You know, the, the vast majority of physicians are good folks doing the right thing, but their reimbursements do come in, in this method. And, and I think we do have to get, a, get ourselves away from that. But I, I want to be clear about this. Is the discussion in Washington right now taking, this is a very hard issue. It is. And it's complicated, it's hard to explain to the public. Is this an issue that's actually being talked about in a serious way oh, in absolutely. these bills? Absolutely, Okay. We don't currently pay physicians to manage care. We currently pay them for an office visit, for ordering an x-ray, for doing a test. We don't pay them, we don't pay a primary care physician to call a specialist and say, I think this is what's going on with this patient. I think this patient needs this kind of follow-up. We don't pay the specialist to get information back to the primary care. We don't pay anybody to manage the care. Some of what happens when a person is readmitted to a hospital after a procedure is because they don't get the follow-up care that they need. There's not a case manager or a nurse calling the person to make sure they were able to get their medications, mm -hmm. to make sure they had a follow-up visit with their primary care physician. We know that we could save the system money if in the medical care home model we had primary care available to people for prevention, care coordination, for pr health promotion activities. We could keep people out of the hospital. We could keep them from being readmitted. The, this sort of approach, dealing with taking that approach, seems to be, that makes more sense to me because it's dealing with the compensation side rather than just people who say, well, we have to focus on wellness care and and getting our technology improved. Uh, and that's some of the, I, I, don't, I, be I believe all of those things are important, but it seems to me that 
doesn't make it for me. This mm -hmm. makes much more sense because it's getting at the fundamental way we compensate people mm -hmm. and therefore you know, can control the cost. And these, yeah, these are big cost drivers in the system, but it's, you know, what we're trying to do in the house, and, and people, you know, are critical because it's so complicated, but it is, you really do have to do all of those things, and, and we're trying to do them simultaneously. Now, some would argue, you know, slow down, just do one at a time, but if we're going to take a shot at health care reform, we need to look at all areas of the system that, that need improvement and do our best to move, move the ball in that direction. I think that's what you're going to see. That's what we're trying to do. We, we would like to do it in a bipartisan way. Um, and, and I hope that you know, we get a system that we can all get our arms around and support as we move forward. You know, uh, one of the really difficult issues that's out there that, that being talked about, being played up, uh, is the question of rationing health care. Colleen, let me start with you. Do we ration health care now, or is it just out there? Well, I think you've set up the question nicely. We hear in this debate that if we go to any changed system, we are going to end up rationing care. And as a matter of fact, as you're alluding to, we ration care right now. We ration care according to who can pay and who cannot pay. We ration care according to who has pre-existing conditions and who does not have pre-existing conditions. We ration care according to whether you have a job or not. So we have rationing. Even George Will pointed out in his editorial not long ago in the Enquirer that we have rationing across the board. Let's put that question aside and let's talk about how we can have a better health care system for more people at a reasonable cost. But the difference is that if we went to a public option, um, the, the fear is that a bureaucrat would decide how we're going to ration care rather than a health care provider. Not, not in the bill. Uh, I mean, these are health care professionals that are, are making decisions. Um, yes, that some of them are now part of the system in the government, but these are health care professionals. These aren't just, you know, some random person off the street uh, making these decisions. But, you know, it, when we talk about rationing of care, how many times, you know, have you personally had the situation where your claim has been denied? Mm -hmm. Well, it happens regularly by insurance companies. Um, the, the trick is to do what we've been talking about, focus on wellness, focus on comprehensive care, and, and that model for reimbursement, rather than fee-for-service. I think there's another important point well, about the rationing. What, I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to ask you two to stay for the second part of the show. <laughs> <laughs> we just can't do this this quick, and this is a real good discussion. So just hold on just a minute. I have to, we have to take a break. So stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break, but we're going to come right back to this discussion. Welcome back. We're talking about health care this morning, and I am joined by Congressman Steve Driehaus of the Ohio 1st Congressional District and Colleen O'Toole, uh, the president of the Greater Cincinnati Health Council. Um, Colleen, when we broke, you were in the middle of wanting to add something to what Steve was saying. What, let's well, pick that up. We were talking about rationing, and I thought a good point in this discussion to make is that we don't always make decisions about care based on the best evidence. We know in certain cases what works and we know what doesn't work. We still have a lot to learn for some procedures and tests, but here's an example. For prostate cancer, there are four different methods of treating prostate cancer. The lowest cost one is about a quarter to a third of the cost of the highest cost one. Among those four, we have no evidence that any one of them works better than any other. Mm. So why would we as a system want to pay for the highest cost one when we don't know that it works any better? If people want choice, people could pay on their own for the highest cost system. But why should the whole system cover something that we don't know works? Are you saying we don't have any evidence because we haven't tried to figure it out? Or because we've tried to figure it out and it doesn't seem like there is any difference? We don't know yet. There isn't okay. enough research done on the, on the comparative effectiveness of those four procedures. So right now, how are those decisions made? Individually between physicians and patients. Patients might hear something that another person they know has had mm -hmm. and they want to try that. It may have worked well for that person, but across a whole population, we don't know if that procedure works better than another one. Steve, a big part of this whole discussion is the public option. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> From your perspective, what is that and 
how do you feel about that? Well, look, there, there are people that would have this be a single payer system, you know, completely run by the government. Um, and there's a lot of push on the left to do that. Uh, the speaker and the leadership have said, you know, we're not going to go there. Uh, however, there is this public option. And the idea is, is that if you don't have employer-based care, and if you have employer-based care, you can keep it. But if you don't have it or if you don't like it, you can go on to this broader health care exchange. And the health care exchange would include the private sector and a public option. So, you know, all of the various insurers would be in there at that first tier level and they would offer their plans and then there would be the public option. The, the reality is, is that there isn't a lot of competition in the marketplace in many parts of this country. In Cincinnati, we have some decent competition. But if you go out into rural areas, you go out into small towns, oftentimes it's just one maybe two. And I, I know it it's kind of strikes people as not where you don't have that competition, can we show that prices are higher, that people are getting, you know, their the competition, the lack of competition in fact has an impact? Sure, on? it's basic economics. You know, if you don't have a competition in the marketplace, prices are going to be higher. And so part of the public option is to ensure competition. Now the public option as defined in this bill is paid for through premiums. It's not subsidized by taxpayers and giving, giving the public option an advantage over the other ones. Um, but we will have the ability to negotiate drug prices. And that's critically important because we know that drug price increases are a cost driver in the system. So we think by providing the public option that it will provide for greater competition. And I realize that strikes people you know, as perhaps an oxymoron, but you know, in fact there, there are savings in, in Medicare. Medicare is a government-run plan, and the administration of Medicare is pretty effective. There are challenges, but it's pretty effective. One of the arguments is that if there's a public option, though, it will destroy private health care. At the beginning, well, it will look like competition, but in the end... The, the analyses that I've seen from the CBO and elsewhere suggest that's just the opposite. Because we're bringing another 45 million people into the system, we're actually going to increase participation mm -hmm. on, on private plans. So we're not driving private plans out of the marketplace at all. Um, but we are providing greater competition. Colleen, from your perspective, um, the hospitals, doctors that you deal with, how do you think, how do you personally, or how, does, how do you think people look at this public option question? I think there are a couple of perspectives. From the hospital's perspective, having more people insured is what's important. And so a question about how they're covered, whether it's through the public option, whether it's through um, private insurance companies, is not as important to the hospitals is what the payment mechanism is, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so what, what the hospitals and the physicians are saying is, look, under Medicare, we get paid it varies in different parts of the country, but in Ohio, for every dollar of care we get paid for a Medicare patient, we get 91 cents back for that care. So we're all, as hospitals, we're already losing money on, on that care. If we're going to have mm -hmm. a public option, don't tie the rates in that public option plan to Medicare because we're going to lose money on even more people. Mm -hmm. And so that's the concern that we hear from, from hospitals and physicians is about how the payment part of the system works, not whether or not there's a public option. And as it stands right now in the bill, they're not tied uh, to Medicare. It, it, it is a separate reimbursement. And again, it's competing with the private sector. There are some other components of this bill that are critically important, and I'll just refer to one, the donut hole. Uh, and, and this in drug in drugs oh, and because yeah. many seniors with Medicare Part D uh, they find out all too often that they spend up to a certain amount and then you know they're halfway through the year and all of a sudden they're paying the full price of drugs I was at my pharmacist just the other day who said yeah he has folks come in and, and one week they're paying fifteen dollars for a prescription the next week it's a thousand dollars for that same prescription and the person doesn't know what's going on. Well, that's, that's that gap in coverage. And, and it exists until you get up to a catastrophic level, at which time it picks up again. And this covers that. Would, this, this bill that's, would that, that's close part that? Of the, don't part hold. of the negotiating that you heard about with the president and, and healthcare industry and, and the pharmaceutical industry, the, well, the negotiation with the pharmaceutical industry is about closing that gap. Mm -hmm. And is that important from your side to close that gap or do you? Of course because you have a whole set of people who are not able to pay for those um, bills when they are in that gap place. I, I, I'm always been confused about that and we went through it when my mother-in-law had to apply for that and it was very confusing. I, I never understood why the donut hole, why it wasn't okay we'll insure up to a certain point if you go beyond that in a year you're going to have to pay. I never understood why you paid the, 
this much, then you had to pay a lot, and then you reach another point where you paid a little again. I, what was the, Well, I, I wasn't there at the time. But is there well, some rationality there that we would lose if we closed the hole? I think it has to do with compromises, compromises. it has to do with costs, mm -hmm. and it has to do with thinking about catastrophic coverage. Okay. Steve, we're almost out of time. Um, what do you think realistically on a time frame that we're looking at here? Look, I, quite frankly, I'm very happy we've taken the time to go out and talk to people and, and talk to providers to understand what's going on. I, I think you're, you're going to see a bill. You're going to see a bill in both the House and Senate sometime in the fall. Sometime this fall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, obviously, this is important to all of us. You will be back. Colleen, you will be back. I'm not sure if it will be with Steve or somebody <laughs> else. Uh, thank you very much for being here this morning. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, thank you Dan. for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Join us again next week to meet the men and the women working to shape the future of our region. Have a good week.